experts told us that it is impossible to organize a national election in the period of four months that we were given. They said you would need 18 months, preferably two years to do it. We made a conclusion that we do not have a voter's role. We must start from scratch because in 1994 uh, you voted as a citizen and people were given cards but there was no national common voters role. South Africa's transition from apartheid to democracy remains one of the most impressive political transitions of our time. It's a miracle story that almost didn't happen. The country's lack of multi-party electoral experience and the violent and persistent clashes between the ANC and the IFP are just some of the factors that stood to derail the process. If they try to sideline us, South Africa will be a catastrophe. We are going to destroy. No one will go to the phones on the 27th. But one thing was clear from the outset. Come what may, free, fair and inclusive elections were to go ahead. But who was going to run these elections? Given the country's history of oppression, a new body or agency with no links to the existing government and broadly representative of South African society had to be formed. So it was that the Independent Electoral Commission, or IEC, first came into being. And on the eve of the Christmas of 1993, the chairperson of the new body, Judge Johann Krichler, would meet with his deputy, then advocate, Dikang Moseneke, and nine other South African commissioners to chart the way forward. None had electoral experience and had just under four months to pull off an election that would normally take two years to put together. It was a political imperative that the elections take place. The date, the 27th of April, had assumed uh, magical proportions. That would be the day, come hell or high water, the elections would take place as determined on that date. But the country was on a knife edge. Members of the far right wing AWB were going around the country destabilizing political gatherings and propagating white supremacist ideas. Violent clashes between the ANC and the IFP were becoming more commonplace as they tried to campaign in each other's strongholds. The violence was further fueled by the Third Force, a secret operative within the South African Security Force, which provided arms and military training to some sectors of the IFP. Over 3,700 people were killed in the political violence of 1993. Throwing a spanner to the works was the multi-party negotiations, a forum between the governing national party, the African National Congress, and other political parties. During the talks, the main negotiating parties, the ANC and the NP, had reached an agreement on a number of issues before taking them to the other parties in the forum. This put considerable pressure on the other parties to either agree with the consensus or to be left out of the process. In protest, the leader of the Ingata Freedom Party, Mangosutu Butelezi, pulled out of the talks and threatened to boycott the elections. Unless, however, King Goodwill Zuelitini was guaranteed special status of the Zulu monarchy and the party granted complete autonomy over the internal politics of KwaZulu. And with the IFP out, the negotiations continued under a cloud of political uncertainty. Then on the 10th of April 1993, the unthinkable would happen. Chris Hani, leader of the South African Communist Party and a senior leader of the ANC, was assassinated outside of his home in Donpak by a Polish far-right-wing immigrant, Janusz Walus. Emotions ran high as fears of a violent backlash swelled throughout the country. But in a message regarded as presidential even before he was president, Nelson Mandela went on national television and called for calm. The call helped to tip the scales in favor of the ANC in the negotiations. Then on the 25th of June 1993, in a bid to derail the talks, members of the AWB dramatically stormed the World Trade Center in Kempton Park, where the negotiations were taking place. They broke through the glass front of the building with an armored vehicle and briefly took over the negotiations chamber the climate of violence would continue into 1994. 
In the last months leading up to the election, there were reportedly as many as 10,000 people killed in related violence. Uh, there were bombs going off, uh, bombs at the at what is now uh, Oliver Tambo International Airport, a bomb in downtown Johannesburg, homeland leaders refusing to come into the process. Things were very, very tense. And with barely a week to go before the elections, the IFP decided to register the party. But the ballot papers had already been printed, so a contingency plan had to be devised. Stickers of the party had to be hastily affixed by hand at the bottom of each ballot paper. It was a costly exercise, but one that would ensure a 95% voter turnout on election day. Then came the 27th of April, 1994, a day that would formally mark an end to apartheid. The election was going to be an African election for Africans and by Africans. And because most of the voters were going to be voting for the first time, there was simply no common voters role to speak of. Our first task was to ensure that every citizen of this nation who's eligible to vote, who's 18 years of age, should be on the voters roll before they vote. We had to demarcate the country into various units where, because we wanted to make sure that everyone is treated equally because that's what the constitution also says. And as voting got underway, reports of long queues and shortages of voting materials started filtering through the media. But the euphoria in the air was nothing short of magical. There was no violence and only a few spoiled ballots were reported. On the day, over 19 million voters turned out for the historic poll. South Africa is a very dynamic society, very vibrant. Politically, in all respect, we, are, we, are, we voice our views very strongly. But the interesting thing about South Africa is when it, com when it comes to elections, we come together. We go, we make sure that those elections are a success. Rajesh Lechman is a coordinator for the National Social Welfare Forum and an ardent advocate for human rights. He remembers the big day with a sense of fondness. I woke up really early that morning. I, I was excited uh, to vote. Um, I'd never voted before, you know, and in the last kind of 10 years of my life before that day, I, a lot of what I'd learned was why it was important for me to be able to vote as a free citizen. And uh, yeah, it was, I, I, I was really excited. For the first time, for me, the symbolism was that I was actually a South African. I mean, I might have been South African before that, but I, I didn't have sort of the legal status of being a South African. I didn't have universal franchise with my fellow countrymen. Paul Wandbeck was the official photographer for the IEC at the time. The most remarkable moment for me uh, was not so much my own voting, but witnessing uh, Nelson Mandela voting for the first time. Um, and I was very nervous, actually. Um, I took about 25 light meter readings <laughs> just to make sure that I was correct. And then he came in eventually and he voted. And uh, I, I got a moment, yeah. The miraculous elections saw Mandela, a former political prisoner, ascend to the presidency of the country. But the Transitional Executive Council, or TEC, which had effectively run the country in the run-up to the elections, had not made any provision in the legislation or in the Electoral Commission Act for what would happen after the elections. There was simply a gap. The IEC had only been mandated to run the 1994 elections and then cease to exist thereafter. I and a number of key senior staff members with the consent of the whole 1994 commission, decided that somebody had to see to the winding down of this exercise. We'd had some 300,000 people working. So we kept a small skeleton staff going. I stayed on uh, and some senior staff members stayed on and we paid the bills, we collected the equipment and then part and parcel of what this team did 
was we planned the continuation of an electoral agency in the country. And by the time the new IEC was established in 97, the foundations had been laid by this little continuation committee. To date, all general and local government elections in South Africa have been deemed free and fair, a capability that has eluded a number of African states after the gaining of independence. The first elections are often carried through by the enthusiasm of the moment. It's the second and third elections when there's no longer the excitement of the honeymoon that, that uh, complacency sets in, apathy sets in, and it's a, it's a known problem. Uh, the the uh, indulgence that people are prepared to expend at the transitional liberation elections runs out and you then are more likely to have problems at subsequent elections. When we had that first voters roll, that united all citizens of this nation, whether we are rich or poor, you appear on that voters roll on the basis of the first letter of your last surname, of your surname. So if you are an A and you live in some corner in an informal settlement, some village, we don't even know you, you'll be top in the list. If you are a Z and you are the president, Z you, you are right at the bottom. So that's the fun of a democracy because that's just what made me really feel we have realized the value of what a democracy is. Equality, human dignity and, and, and fairness. But sentiment alone was not going to be enough to sustain the miracle story. As a developing nation and a growing democracy, South Africa had no choice but to embrace innovative technology in the running of future elections. We evolved a system of doing a, a, a voter's role that was unique throughout the world, uh, working on a GPS system, working closely with the national census, in, in, in organizing uh, constituencies and voters' registration areas linked to the, to the national census areas, which made it possible to locate people, not by addresses, but by their physical location on the globe at certain coordinates, which was an enormous breakthrough. We could we have a voters' role that functions well. So I'm particularly proud of how we did the voters' role. I'm particularly proud of the technique of registration and voting and recording of uh, people having gone through the vote by means of the zip-zip machine. If we had not had those machines, we would not have been able to get 15 million people on a voters' roll in one weekend. And then we finished with the rest, uh, I think it was about two million and so on, because I think the first elections we had about uh, 18 million citizens in the voters' roll, and that all end. And using that technology, we were able to compile the voters' roll in a very short space of time. The successes would continue with subsequent elections. For example, the second democratic elections were prepared and delivered in the record time of 13 months, and to date, the IEC has over 25 million registered voters in its voters' roll. But electoral success over the past 20 years has not necessarily translated into a better life for all. Widespread poverty and inequality remain South Africa's biggest challenges. Based on our seventh economic and social rights report, there are certain components of uh, economic and social rights which seem to be moving backward and retrogressing in many respects. Uh, particularly, uh, access to sanitation and clean water have been identified as particular problems. The housing situation in South Africa has still not been fully addressed. And we noticed that maternal mortality has increased significantly since 1990, and the child mortality levels are at the same level today as they were in 1990. And this reflects a retrogression uh, of those rights to um, socioeconomic rights in particular. Whereas we are meant to be moving towards the progressive realization of socioeconomic rights, it appears as if we are taking a step backward. 
Lucy Holborn, a social and economic researcher, feels that the country's transition from apartheid to democracy did bring some positive changes amid the challenges. On the sort of political side of things, I think we've done well. Certainly in the initial transition period, there's enormous potential there for that to be quite violent, to be quite divided. And I think, you know, specific leaders such as Mandela, Desmond Tutu, those sorts of people were really, um, you know, pushed for those processes to be cohesive and to be as united as possible. So I think in that sense, we've actually done really well. We've tran transitioned to a democracy very peacefully, um, bringing most people along with us, and that's really positive. Considering South Africa's history of racial oppression, it's not surprising that South Africans continue to vote largely along racial lines. Race remains a critical issue uh, for all of us as South Africans. I, I remember um, traveling to the United States uh, about two years ago. I, I, I lived there for a year. And uh, because I had to fill out a social security form, uh, one of the requirements in the form is to identify your race. And there were a couple of categories available, one of which was um, Hispanic, which I clearly wasn't, or white, which was one of the other categories. And then one of the, the last categories was black, which I ticked off uh, because I clearly identify myself as a black person in the context of uh, our democracy. We must openly talk about race uh, and equality in South Africa. I think it's the only way that as a country we are able to move forward from the terrible past that we had all, all, all had to endure uh, under apartheid. Human rights activist Sipo Mandula agrees with Kayum's assessment of race in the country and feels it's an issue that needs to be explored not only from a past perspective, but also from a continually changing present. Going forward is to say how do we manage our emotions, how do we manage our understanding of different races. And generally if you look at the, even this concept of colored, you find that it was an apartheid law creation of 1950 where it was taming people colors and there was no even a clear meaning or who is a colored person but if you look at the a, a generic meaning of colored people they see themselves as indigenous people they see themselves as the first nation people they see themselves as africans lucy believes the country's tough economic climate does play a role in exacerbating our racial divides Increasingly, the, the divisions aren't strictly racial. They're actually between class groups. They're between the unemployed, they're between the low-skilled workers, they're between the sort of economic elite. Um, and those, I think, increasingly are the sort of divisions that people feel in their day-to-day -day lives. They see so-and-so living in this way, and it's such a different experience of life that, you know, it, it affects our cohesiveness as a society. It affects how we can relate to each other and understand each other. There are lots of other issues in society, actually, that we are quite united in, in sort of um, opposing or, or wanting to fight, such as crime or, you know, we're all interested in improving education. The problem is often that the political rhetoric around these issues doesn't bring people together. So you get right-wing groups saying, you know, crime is a white issue when actually it's affecting all South Africans. Um, or you might say education's only affecting poor black people, but actually everybody wants good education. So I think um, there's this sense that we need to try and unite around these issues and actually choose issues that do unite people and that people generally um, want to stand around and st or stand against, as the case may be. Um, so we're, we're focusing more on our commonalities rather than our differences. So where to for South Africa? Are we still living the dream? Or is it perhaps time to wake up? As a nation, we have done incredible things. What, what we have achieved, the number of people with access to clean drinking water, the number of people who have access to basic health care, the number of new hospitals built, the number of children who get free primary education. These are incredible successes. And, and it's something that I think sometimes, in, maybe in the current climate of all the politicking and stuff that goes on, we might miss that. But we have achieved incredible things in South Africa in, you know, since the advent of democracy, if you call it that. And we mustn't forget that. And I think any discontent people have now is because it's not enough. You know, we, we expect to have been a lot further along the road by now. And maybe we should have been, but you, you, you must bear in mind what we are doing in South Africa, 
this process of going from apartheid to democracy has never been done anywhere else in the world. You know, we, 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 we are at the beginning, we, we are in an, a social experiment on the magnitude that has never been seen anywhere in the world. No other country has done this. I believe in South Africans. South Africans will not, we are very alert. We are an alert nation. We will not allow a situation that will take us back. So if there are pieces of legislation that will take us back, we'll, South Africans will speak and they will use avenues that are available. They use the courts, they use their lobbying mechanisms to ensure that whatever comes out as legislation is in sync with the constitution that was agreed